Hello, everybody. My name is Tori Reibel, and I'm going to be giving the lecture today on Chapter 11 from our textbook. And Chapter 11 is titled Relationships of Indigenous Peoples to Natural Resources. And I chose this chapter because my husband and I recently bought a house about a year ago that actually borders the Pokagon Band of Potawatomi Indians uh, tribal land. And it wasn't until we moved here that I really looked deeper into what native land and territories meant in regards to certain wildlife species. And we actually have found an active breeding um, eastern box turtle, female eastern box turtle on our land and contacted the tribe who was very interested in tagging her uh, for their population studies since we were adjacent to their tribal land. Um, so tribal and state agencies do carry out different studies and research and population efforts, et cetera. So um, this chapter really stood out to me to explore that a little bit deeper. And as a part of the discussion for this lecture, you all will get an opportunity to uh, find out what Native people's land you reside on if you don't already know or aren't already familiar with that. So to start, uh, we will do an overview of today. We're going to go into what the proper Native people's terminology is and what our chapter uses to refer to them as throughout. Then we are going to go into population numbers of Native people, both in the past and present and where there are current and active reservations today. Next, we'll discuss what nature and natural resources mean to Indigenous peoples and what TEK is, what it stands for and what it means, which will then take us into cultural importance and the extreme cultural importance of wildlife and natural resources to the Native people and their connections with these things. Then we're going to touch on the relationship between the U.S. federal government and tribal leaders and communities and what management of natural resources looks like between these two entities. And we'll end with how sometimes the way that those two entities manage can cause conflicts, but how tribal leaders and the U.S. government works to reach conflict resolution and maintain a mutual respect and acknowledge, acknowledgement of one another's differences and similarities because um, they are trying to reach the same end goal at the end of the day. So uh, to start throughout chapter 11, the authors note right off the back, they will uh, use the following terms when referring to any Aboriginal people of the United States and their descendants. And those terms are Native people, Native American, American Indian, and Indian people. And as you might notice, these are pretty broad terms. And so specific tribal names are used when applicable, applicable and talking about uh, specific tribal uh, religious beliefs or ceremonies uh, specific to that tribe. So Native American population numbers were much greater throughout North America before the arrival of European settlers. I'm sure many of us are familiar with that. Um, Native American uh, territories and areas did range all the way from the tip of Southern Florida to the upper Northern Pacific Northwest. And unfortunately their population numbers began declining around the year 1600 uh, at the arrival of European settlers and specifically due to diseases that European settlers did bring over that they did not have any natural immunities to. And some of these diseases included measles, smallpox, and influenza. And it's believed that these diseases reduced their population numbers by up to 90%. And on top of this, again, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, the Indian people were subjected to government policies aimed at alienating them uh, from society and pushing them aside, casting them from society. So this map that we're looking at is in our textbook and it is what's left of the ancestral Native American territories in the form of reservations. And these reservations were a result of hundreds of treaties that were established between the US government and tribal entities to set aside and allocate land specifically for the Native people. However, you'll notice obviously from the Southern tip of Florida to the very far uh, Pacific Northwest, there's not a ton of land uh, left 
for those reservations, um, specifically for those reservations. However, in 1871, the Indian Appropriations Act was passed and this prohibited any more establishments of treaties between the two entities. And as of today, the Native American population numbers are on the rise uh, with the US government recognizing 566 different tribes. And if a tribe is federally recognized, this means that they are eligible for funding and service, different services from the Bureau of Indian Affairs from the US government. And uh, these tribes differed greatly of how they viewed natural resources than the typical Western viewpoint does. And there are three main differences worth noting or perspectives, and those are sustenance, interconnectedness, and TEK, which stands for traditional ecological knowledge. And we are gonna walk through each one of those now. So starting with sustenance, the native peoples really viewed and utilized the land as a direct resource for anything of sustenance that they needed, for their livelihoods, for their food, for their homes. They utilized everything, forests and trees. The limber was used for building homes, making fires, creating tools and weapons for hunting. The natural vegetation, such as roots, grasses and nuts, and forbs were used for food sources as well as different medicine. And rivers and streams and other riparian habitats were really important, as you can imagine, for fishing, as well as hunting, hunting, gathering, um, and water for the overall community, um, as well as some agricultural practices. So as you can imagine, they're really dependent on the health of these ecosystems. A healthy, abundant ecosystem was crucial to their own survival and livelihood. And so they took the health of the ecosystem into great consideration when utilizing those natural resources. And because of this deep connection that they had and dependency on, this, on the natural environment and its resources, Native Americans truly viewed themselves as a part of nature. They were one with nature. They were not separate from it. Um, and they viewed themselves as an extension of it. So whatever happens to nature, they believed happened to them as well. So if the environment was polluted, their bodies were also polluted. If the environment was sick or ill, they were also sick. Um, they also believed in not having any sort of ownership or rights over other living creatures out in the natural world, uh, which is in direct contrast to the Western Christian world viewpoint of humans having a direct dominion or a divine right over other living things and creatures. And these tribal values and beliefs are often represented in the shape of a circle, um, which represents the never ending balance. There's really no start, there's really no end. Um, you know, the balance and harmony between the native peoples and their natural worlds. And the tribes would represent this uh, shape as well in some of their practices and cultural rituals. So things such as the medicine wheel was the shape of a circle. Again, um, just representing that there's no end, um, no starting point and everything was cyclical. And then the third perspective we'll talk about is TEK and TEK, TEK stands for traditional ecological knowledge. And this is basically the cumulative historical knowledge base of the land that surrounds them as well as um, the biological process, processes and the ecological knowledge that native peoples have gathered um, for generations and generations in order to better understand the world around them. So again, bio biological processes, ecological processes, as well as um, history of natural resources. And this knowledge was specific to each tribe's territory or range. So as you can imagine, wherever they were based in their territory or their range, this is where their TEK uh, was specific towards. And this TEK can oftentimes be what causes conflict with non-native wildlife managers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a couple slides, uh, but here is a good clip and you can click up above here from the Nature Conservancy that talks about traditional ecological knowledge as it relates to the people and management in the Great Bear Rainforest. So go ahead and click there. Okay, so the wildlife surrounding uh, tribal territories and the natural processes 
out in the wild held a lot of cultural meaning as well to indigenous people. Large game animals in particular were revered in different hunting rituals and prayer both before and after a hunt. And the chapter discusses a few examples of this, one of them being the Zuni peoples uh, would hold specific ceremonies and protocols when hunting for the mule deer, which was one of their most cult culturally important species. And I did find a video of one of these cultural uh, dances and protocols um, for a mule deer hunt that you can pause and take a look at up above. They would adorn uh, mule deer antlers and it's pretty cool. It's about nine minutes long, so you don't have to watch the whole thing, but just to kind of give you an idea of what this looks like. Um, and again, they really believed in respecting all of the wildlife species that they hunted and treating them ethically before and after a hunt. So song and dance, we can see this middle pillar here. Animals were also respected and represented through different songs and dances. Various tribes would use wild turkey feathers in their songs and dances. Um, they would use the feathers to decorate headdresses or um, other parts of their um, clothing. And these feathers were also specifically placed at shrines as a form of a prayer. Um, there was even some ancient archaeological evidence of turkey domestication by some of the southwestern tribes. And so this indicates that they've had a long-standing relationship and kinship to this species, the wild turkey specifically. And then lastly, over to the far right there, wildlife was also just a really um, important form of spirituality for them, spiritual healing. Many tribal origin stories place wildlife as the direct descendant of Native American people. The Ojibwa people um, in my home state of Michigan, I know their origin story relate goes back to a wolf. Um, bison is also a very iconic species for many different tribes and is a symbol of strength and endurance. Oops. So as I mentioned earlier, there are 566 federally recognized tribes, which are referred to as sovereign Indian nations. And these nations act as a nation of themselves within a nation. And what I mean by that is so, although they're located within the United States, they do have full autonomy and authority over their own lands and natural resources within their own nation. And this does include wildlife. And between all of the tribes, there is more than 22.5 million hectares of land that is managed um, in these sovereign Indian nations. So obviously that's a large portion of land. And as you can imagine, um, there's a lot of collaboration that needs to go into, uh, into managing that land when it comes to any federal or state managed land that might be right next to, directly next to, or adjacent or touching any of that tribal land or sovereign, sovereign Indian nation's land. And in 2000, Bill Clinton passed an executive order which required the U.S. government to consult with tribal governments and tribal leaders before going on and just developing any policies that might directly influence or impact the tribes. Um, they couldn't do that before talking to them and coming to some sort of understanding. But even with this relationship, there still is sometimes conflict, uh, as with any relationship. And the most common source of that conflict can really be whittled down to three main categories. Recreational versus substance hunting, scientific data versus TEK or traditional ecological knowledge, and sometimes just a lack of cultural consideration for, for indigenous people and their culture and their religious beliefs. And so we're gonna start over on the left here at recreational versus substance hunting. You know, overall for native peoples, hunting for food was considered to be a very serious and careful matter. They believed that harvesting an animal requires two kinds of knowledge, both the biological knowledge and the spiritual knowledge. So again, a lot of spirituality was wrapped up in this uh, harvest and this idea of substance hunting. And while recreational hunting does bring enjoyment, um, and it also does bring shared experiences with family and friends and loved ones, it really comes down to and is considered more of a individualistic personal benefit than a community benefit or um, action. And 
sub substance hunting refers more to uh, a community goal or giving back to the greater community. It strives to maximize um, what the greater community needs, so nourishment for all. And conflict can really arise when it comes to this, um, the differences between these two when it comes to bag limits or harvest quotas. And I know in Michigan this comes up, um, I'm sure it comes up with more species, but the one I th think that I can think of off the top of my head is lake sturgeon. Um, there's a very, very small um, harvest allowed of lake sturgeon. I, it changes year to year, but I think last year it was like five sturgeon. And the, so the season was over within like 28 minutes, under a half hour. Um, and, you know, the Michigan DNR is really there and making sure that we there no one goes over five. Um, however, the tribes have their own limit. So the, the five um, that the DNR oversees does not include what the tribe uh, harvest limits are. And so sometimes that causes some controversy um, because they are really um, special and ancient fish. So moving on to the second pillar there, we talked about TEK earlier and TEK is really uh, more observation based than sometimes the typical Western scientific method or data collection. So there can be conflict around which one is truly more accurate. And this comes up a lot when dealing with population numbers. Again, the sturgeon example is a good example, um, as well as different statuses of species. So native people oftentimes can put more weight into the TEK knowledge. Again, that's been passed on from generation to generation. It's firsthand knowledge. Um, you can't really blame them for putting more weight on that. But the non-native uh, management agencies or um, officials sometimes will place, or most of the time will place more weight on the hard, you know, scientific data collected through the scientific method. And sometimes those numbers don't match up. So what do you do when that happens? Um, and our chapter does, gives an example of the Inuit peoples and the polar bear. So there is a controversy where the Inuit peoples Based on their TEK knowledge, they believe that the harvest number of polar bears could increase. However, the non-native wildlife agencies um, thought that there was no indication of being able to up that uh, based on the population numbers they believe to be out there. Um, and so that can especially get a little bit hairy when it comes to a species so, um, so as threatened as the polar bear. Um, and then the third pillar here, lack of cultural consideration. Some scientists or citizens will question the overall cultural traditions of certain tribes as it relates to conservation. So a good example of this is whale hunting. Whale hunting is a very traditional practice. It's extremely important to many tribes. And uh, the discussion reading for this lecture will go into this a little bit more, as well as this short video clip. So you can go ahead and click above to watch. This goes into describing the extreme controversy that we see when it comes to whale hunting and what is right for the species, but also right for these different cultural standpoints and people that are represented. So there's multiple different stakeholders involved. There's the, um, there's the tribal entities, the tribal managers, as well as the non-tribal managers. And then we get people in there uh, such as wildlife or animal advocacy groups. Um, so it's pretty interesting. It's a short little video and you can just click here. So while there's a potential for conflict between all of these things, government agencies and the tribal communities really do strive to collaborate and find a middle ground. So they do really work to integrate TEK, traditional ecological knowledge, with that more scientific method data collection to guide management. And an example of this is working to restore native and traditional fire practices. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with prescribed burns and how there's different habitat goals and management goals when non-native agencies use uh, prescribed fire and burns. And there is uh, California tribes that also conduct burns around different seasonalities, uh, time of year uh, for bear grass specifically. So bear grass communities are essential to these California tribes and their basket weaving tradition. So again, coming together 
integrating some of that TEK of the seasonality, importance of timing with the bear grass, with some of maybe the other um, ecological and habitat or ecosystem goals that the non-native wildlife agency has as well to come together and kind of reach both objectives. So in summary, oops, sorry, in summary, territories and populations of native peoples drastically decrease after the arrival of Europeans. Native Americans view nature as an extension of oneself. They view that they are a part of nature. And because of this, they have uh, a really thorough observation-based cumulative historical knowledge base, which is TEK, uh, from which they make their management decisions. The federal government is also required to collaborate with tribal leaders and tribal entities before developing any sort of policy or legislation that may impact indigenous rights and their culture. And then cultural differences are often the cause of these um, different disagreements and conflicts between native and non-native wildlife uh, managers. But as we just talked about in the fire example, these differences can be mitigated with an overall greater understanding of Native people's rights, values, and beliefs. And with that, here are my three questions. Explain what TEK stands for and describe what it means. What shape best describes the Native American relationship to wildlife and natural resources? Culture-based conflicts sometimes arise between native and non-native wildlife managers, often in regard to recreational versus substance harvest. Explain the differences between the two. And then here are my sources. So thank you all so much. I hope um, you took something away from that and I'm really excited to see where our discussion goes. Thank you. <laughs>